or very large, uh, very large vision uh, models or something else like that. Um, the question is, how can we get robots to get very good performance while having this difficulty of robots interacting with the environment being costly and expensive, time consuming, and potentially risky? Um, so we take inspiration from humans. And there's a lot of different ways that like humans as embodied agents interact with the environment. Um, and a lot of different ways and things that humans do to make it so they can learn more efficiently. Um, in the top corner, uh, you can see um, a demonstration of stacking the block, followed by a younger child uh, also stacking the block showing how humans can learn from observing other humans doing the cell, uh, seeing the results of dissimilar agents um, performing tasks. Um, here we have uh, a map representation from an early paper in the late 40s about showing how humans and other animals had map-like representations in their brains. Um, so these representations are important for efficient learning. Um, we also have uh, people talking to uh, their children, instructing them and telling them what to do. And this ability to interpret natural language instruction um, allows us to more efficiently interact with the world. And finally, we have our natural curiosity. Um, people are interested in doing things uh, and we go out, we look at the world, even when there's not necessarily any goal, we just like learning these things. Um, and this is especially prevalent in children, but uh, hopefully it perseveres throughout your life and academic study. So how do we actually take all of these um, ideas at a high level of things that humans can do that robots can't? and make it so we can have actual systems that can exploit these in order to get better performance. So I'm going to be talking about uh, three areas of work that I've done during my PhD, um, learning from videos of humans, uh, exploiting natural language, and uh, curious exploration. So first, uh, let's look at learning from videos of humans. So, you have a demonstration of some expert, some adult, stacking a large pile of blocks. Mm -hmm. And by watching that, a child should be able to learn about um, how to stack the blocks themselves, uh, that certain blocks can fit better on other blocks. Um, and this extends beyond blocks to many different behaviors that people are interested in. So we looked at this in the context of um, model predictive control, uh, where we want to build a prediction model that um, is action conditioned. So given actions A and a state X, we can predict a state X P plus one. And we want to train, traditionally these, this is trained just on data of a robot. So uh, state X actions A, um, and you know the trajectories of the robot interacting with the world. And if you have enough trajectories, you can train a very good prediction model. But if you don't have enough trajectories of the robot interacting with the world, um, or you don't have enough trajectories of the robot doing interesting things, we want to also be able to use data of people interacting with the world. However, since people don't have a similar action spaces for robots, um, since they are instrumented in the same way, we don't have the ability to directly get actions for people um, when collecting the data. So instead of having states X and actions A, we just have a sequence of states X, a video of the person moving through the scene. And we want to be able to use both kinds of data. So in order to do this, we introduce a latent action um, and then use that latent action to uh, condition the action condition prediction model. And this allows us to perform planning. So more concretely, uh, we build a system that looks uh, somewhat like this, where we have a action encoder A that encodes the action when it's available. Q 
to some link in action. And we have an inverse model that given a state and a next state also predicts the link in action. So when we have human data, I mean, sorry, when we have robot data, we can make the output of the action encoder and the output of the inverse model be similar. And then the output of either one of them should be a link in action that we can use to train our transition model. Then when we only have access to the human data, which doesn't have actions, we simply use the inverse model uh, on the human data and the future states of the human data to get a link in action that can allow us to train the transition model on the human data. So this basic approach allows us to make it so the transition model, which is the majority of the weights and the complexity of the system, can be trained from both kinds of data. Um, however, people and robots uh, look fairly different. And also, more importantly, they can move in different ways. So when we are making our latent space, we uh, learn priors uh, that are either shared between domains or separated on different domains, make it so each domain can respond differently and can contain different kinds of actions. Uh, people can twist and rotate while the robot pinch in a way that um, people cannot. So by having the uh, shared and separate priors, it allows the uh, action to be separated. So in order to test this, um, we build a data set of humans and robots interacting with the world. Um, so if you note, uh, you'll see that this was all collected on the same setup, uh, the same table. Um, the robot is actually in the back right here, just twisted out of frame. And the other important thing is to note is that the humans are generally performing more interesting than complicated tasks, in this case, uh, sweeping. And getting the robot to sweep an object is very difficult if you don't actually know how to sweep already, if you're just doing some kind of random exploration. So this human data contains object-to-object -object interactions that don't really exist in the same scale or quantity as in the robot data. So hopefully we'll be able to exploit the human data and these interactions to get better performance uh, with the robot when it gets to these more interesting and difficult situations. Uh, so first we train our model and we look at the action reconstructions that come out of this. And we see the red arrow is the decoded action um, from the latent back into the robot's action space. And the blue and green arrows are the ground truth action. Uh, so the action produced by the inverse model, the latent action produced by the inverse model, when it's decoded back into the robot latent space, um, points more or less in the direction the human hand is moving. Uh, indicating that this action is roughly doing something reasonable. Do you mind if I ask a quick question, Carl? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Stop at any time. But you're doing this decoding. Are you using like end effector control? Like, how is the latent exactly the vector here and not something more complicated you can't figure out because the latent can be anything? Yeah. So the, um, the latent action is. Uh, some high dimensional latent, um, but we also train a um, decoder to go from the latent back to the action. Um, and the the actual action um, is the end effect of position, uh, end effect of displacements of the robot and some additional things for like commanding grip, grasp and stuff. So the parts of the end effector, I mean, the parts of the action that we're visualizing in this are just the um, XY components of the uh, end effector. 
position. So we're pulling out the the gripper and other things that don't visualize it nicely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And anybody else, if you have questions, feel free to stop me at any time. Cool. Yeah, so we have uh, good actions coming out of our action decoder and the inverse model. Uh, so now we want to look at how this actually uh, translates to uh, video prediction. So um, as you can see from these results, uh, the prediction quality is uh, far from perfect, but there's a definite improvement in performance between uh, FAVP, which is the baseline video prediction model that we used, uh, trained only on robot data, and our model trained on both robot and human data. And we can see that there's less uh, shrieking um, when the objects interact with other objects, and when the hand grasps something, it's more likely to actually move rather than tearing. Uh, so these are all things relating to objects, interacting with object, other objects, or the robot grasping objects, which are things that are relatively rare to see in the random robot data set. Um, so this uh, translates into improved manipulation performance. If we take the prediction model and use like a planner, such as cross-entry method, to find a sequence of actions that maximizes the goal. Uh, we can see that in several cases, um, uh, our model uh, trained with both robot and human data is able to better complete tasks involving uh, multi-object interactions. And here is the, uh, I guess, zoomed in view of how the model performs. At the top, you can see the commanded motion uh, so the red dots are supposed to move to the green dots. Um, you can see the predicted trajectory um, that the planner generated when it was trying to find a sequence of actions. Um, and you can see the actual behavior that the robot took, which successfully moved the objects to the goal location. Um, and there's definitely some uh, imprecisions in the planning, but the underlying prediction model is relatively robust to um, pixel level inaccuracies as far as uh, generating commands. Um, and we can see this again for other objects um, because I always uh, move my pairs around with spatula. And again, uh, sweeping into a dustpan, um, which isn't quite successful, but is able to move them in roughly the correct direction. So this was um, a fairly successful start, but there's a lot of problems with the previous formulation. First, uh, video prediction is a very difficult problem. So solving video prediction in order to solve control is always challenging to do. Um, additionally, because the video prediction relies on pixel level predictions into the future, it's very difficult you have systems where you have a, a very large domain gap between the human data and the robot data. So if we want to move the system out of the lab and into the real world, where we're collecting data of people performing tasks in their house, we need to uh, take potentially a different track. So in the next work, uh, I investigated how to learn from humans using model-free reinforcement learning. So in, we follow a, a standard uh, off, uh, batch reinforcement learning algorithm approach where we want to build up a replay pool uh, containing uh, tuples uh, with states, next states, actions, and rewards. And then we feed that into uh, some batch reinforcement learning algorithm, in our case, soft actor critic. And this will learn a policy on the, that set of tuples that maximizes the uh, reward. Um, and it can also be used to gather more data from interacting with the environment. So 
we want to be able to insert the human data directly into this replay pool um, and use it as part of the learning process. However, um, there's some difficulties with using human data. The human data, it has no actions as we've previously looked into. It has no rewards. And it also has fairly substantial domain shift between the human and the robot data. So we tackle all of these problems with uh, very simple approaches and show that despite their simplicity and naivety, um, you can get relatively good performance uh, with the human data. So first, uh, we look at reward prediction. And we make a simple assumption that the observed human trajectories are successful and optimal. Um, so we assign a small reward value to all non-terminal states in a sequence and a large value to the terminal state in a sequence. Um, and this makes some potentially questionable assumptions, such as the fact that like, if you complete the task before the end, it still gives you a small reward rather than a large reward. And it assumes that the human always successfully completes the task. But since you're building a data set of the human data, um, a lot of these assumptions are acceptable, tolerable. Um, then for action prediction, uh, we follow a similar approach to my previous work, where we train an inverse model on the interaction data, uh, the robot data. And we use this to predict actions on the human data. And to handle the domain shift, uh, we map the observations to some domain invariant embedding. And so in order to give this domain invariant embedding, uh, we use adversarial domain adaptation, where we train a discriminator that tries to distinguish between uh, a human embedding and a robot embedding and determine which domain they came from, while the networks responsible for the embedding try to learn an embedding such that the screener cannot determine between them. We additionally uh, add some pair data to the system. Uh, where we have human and robot states that we expect to be fairly similar, and we therefore minimize the difference between the embedding. And we find this pair of data helps make it so the um, mapping between the human and the robot data is actually meaningful and useful for a downstream task. So if we stick it all together, um, we have a system that learns rewards by assigning the terminal state a high reward, learns actions by using an inverse model, and has a domain embedding by using adversarial domain notation. And we combine the data from the robot, the interaction data, with the observation data and the stuff we generate to make a replay pool that can be fed directly into the battery enforcement running output. So once we have this system, this leads to a few experimental questions. Uh, first, how robust are we actually to unsuccessful observations, unsuccessful trajectories? Um, will this choice of reward function break everything or is it uh, usable? Um, so then next, uh, can this help solve robotic tasks in complicated environments? And finally, can we actually use this to learn useful information from humans? So first, let's look at how RLD can leverage the multiple demonstration. Um, in this setting, we look at the Aquabot environment, where we have a double pendulum that's trying to sway up. And we train a uh, soft active critic on this for about a million time steps. And we get a model that forms as well as this dashed line. Um, and we take the um, sample trajectories from this policy and use those to um, train several different models. 
uh, our method shown in orange, uh, blue and red are existing behavior cloning from observation methods, and green is uh, stock after critic uh, training over time. And we see that the behavior cloning methods all learn very quickly and achieve quite good results. Um, while the soft act critic, the standard reinforcement learning, takes much longer to learn. However, uh, people and robots look different. So expecting the demonstrations to be perfect in every way is not a good assumption and not the case that we necessarily care about. Can you hear us okay, Carl? Uh, yeah, I can. Was there a question? Is, is this the standard Acrobot? Because I remember that I had discrete action. So I'm curious how will you, like if this is the, like some continuous action version, you mentioned using stack. Yeah, so this is the standard one. I believe that's continuous action space. Um, So I, I can't quite hear what you're asking. Uh, do you want to ask it louder? Um, for this Acrobot environment, is the action space discrete or continuous? I believe it's continuous. Okay, so this isn't the demo. This is the EMT now. Okay. I think you could. Okay. Think you can go ahead, Carl. Thank you. Okay, cool. So then we look at, I guess, the opposite case, where our demonstration uh, is this dashed line. So very almost random uh, demonstration. Uh, so if we're given this bad uh, trajectories, um, both the behavior cloning methods uh, fail pretty poorly. Um, our method learns quickly, but plateaus at less than the suboptimal, less than the optimal uh, score for this environment. And the standard uh, reinforcement learning uh, learns slower, but eventually surpasses our method. So if you give us uh, completely random demonstrations, we will fail, uh, but not necessarily as badly as other methods. But the human demonstrations aren't completely random. People do meaningful and useful things, just not necessarily quite in the way that robots will. So the case that we're actually most interested in is the case where the demonstrations have some middle quality. Um, they accomplish the task, but not necessarily in the most optimal way. And in this case, the prior methods um, still form about as well as the demonstration. Uh, standard reinforcement learning takes a while to learn in green. Well, our method uh, learns very quickly and also reaches the optimal result. So we can leverage these uh, suboptimal demonstrations to get uh, good performance in a new environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carl, just mm -hmm. how do you, like you measure this as middle quality in terms of demonstration. So how do you know something that's of middle quality? Like how do you measure that when you're collecting it? Yeah, so basically um, we knew what like the maximum reward was. We knew what like the minimum reward was. And this was roughly taken from someplace in the middle. Um, also, it was taken just before the model fully converged uh, that we we're using to collect the data. Um, but it's, I guess, not a scientifically rigorous process that this middle quality data corresponds to, say, middle quality data that we would get from an actual human interacting with the world. Um, but it's a promising sign, I would say. All right. One other thing I was wondering about, you know, your motivation for this in the beginning was also you wanted to use model free reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. So here you have model free and behavior cloning, but there's no model based reinforcement learning comparison, uh, which yeah, seems like true. something similar. 
for model based RL might be more data efficient. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that we definitely could have added a few more comparison to model based methods. Um, Okay. I was just wondering if you had some reason because you specifically didn't want to compare it to model based or it was um, just those. The the main reason I think was that the main model based method that we were working at with at this time was like deep visual foresight. Um and like deep visual foresight works fairly nicely if you're doing tabletop control tasks where you're pushing objects on like some surface due to like the, the structure of the model. Um, but if you start getting into more three-dimensional tasks, it performs a lot worse. So regardless of, I guess, how well the model trained or um, how well the model could exploit human data, just like the, the way that the model is structured with um, predicting the flows and pixels would make it so it wouldn't perform well on some of the robotic tasks I'm going to show next. Um, but I think that if like you read this paper um, now, there's a lot more like good model based control pipelines that potentially could have worked out of the box um, and been useful baselines. Um, but mostly like a software engineering limitation and what model-based pipelines were available to us when we were doing this and what we had running. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So robot task. Um, we have pushing, we have door opening. Uh, so in the pushing task, you have to move the object to the goal location, and with the door opening task, you have to pull open the door. Um, and these require uh, some motion in 3D where you have to like hook the door um, and pull it back to successfully accomplish the task. So in these uh, examples, we have uh, near optimal demonstration and no domain shift. And our method works very well in that case, as you would expect if you put new optimal demonstrations into your replay pool, um, it, it just should work. Um, the, the kind of interesting thing is that behavior cloning from observation and uh, the other prior methods for learning from observation don't seem to generalize very well to more complicated action spaces and um domains so that's just a interesting thing about the prior work um but now we get to the interesting part of uh, can we actually use this to do things on robots well things with videos from people unfortunately not on robots due to the pandemic um and I had I collected a lot of videos of myself uh, pushing around objects and opening up drawers in my kitchen, and we had a simulator that was somewhat aligned but fairly visually different that we wanted to train the agent to work in. Um, so first, I collected a lot of paired data, and this paired data um, was automatically paired between uh, random robot exploration and the initial frames of the human demonstration. So we never have um, paired examples of like the person actually completing the task or anything else that's like fairly far um, along a successful trajectory. It's mostly paired data clustered near the beginning of the sequences. Another thing to note is that the pairing is fairly imperfect. So a lot of the uh, images that were paired together um, the human is in contact with the puck while the robot is not in contact with the puck. And despite this being a fairly small visual difference, uh, only of a few pixels, um, this causes a large difference in the dynamics of the system. Um, but the, the pairing and the model is somewhat robust to that. So 
Now we see uh, the performance server method. Uh, and ours is shown in orange. Uh, standard reinforcement learning is shown in green. And reinforcement learning plus uh, some exploration bonus is shown in blue. And we can see that um, our method, by exploring the human data, can get um, to learn good policies in about half as many time steps, so half as many environmental interactions as using the human, uh, not using the human data. So this is a interesting and promising first step, but there's still a, quite a bit of work to do in this area. Um, we were constrained either to uh, um, single environments or to single tasks, while real-world human data um, and real-world robots will should hopefully be able to accomplish many tasks in many different environments. Um, and there's large-scale data sets that have this capability. Um, we just need to design better systems to better exploit them. Okay, so I'm going to change uh, gears a bit and start talking about um, how to make robots uh, more curious. So even with uh, perfect human data, um, there's still going to be some domain gap between the robot and the human. So you're always going to need some data of the robot interacting with the world. And in our previous work, we either had like some reinforcement learning policy or a random exploration driving this data collection for robots. But that's uh, quite inefficient. Instead, what we want to be able to do is we want the robot to be able to go out and seek interesting things about the environment, find places where it doesn't know a lot about it, and go to places where it'll learn the most possible. And so we explore this in the context of object goal navigation. You have an agent put down into an unknown house, and it has to find a specified object. It doesn't know the floor plan, it doesn't know where that object is, it just has to drive around and try to find the object it's looking for. Um, so people uh, are quite good at navigation. Uh, we can get around cities and buildings, not necessarily as fast as we'd like all the time, but we can still get uh, to various places quite well. And a lot of that based on how we build up representations in our mind. Uh, we have some form of maps. And these maps are frequently based on landmarks and semantics. And there's been various work from the uh, neuroscience community about how these actually work. Um, but having ideas about like where landmarks are spatially grounded seems to be important for how people interact with the world. Um, so thinking about uh, maps, we look at um, existing work on object or navigation, where an agent builds a map of the scene and then selects a goal in the map and drives to that with some policy, some local policy. However, what do you do when the goal isn't in the map? Um, is the question. The, the agent should be able to curiously explore, should be able to reason about object relationships and how things are spaced relative to each other, and use that information to go out and seek what it's looking for. So there, even when uh, an object can't be seen, there's still a lot of useful information in the world. Um, if you have a robot sitting in a kitchen that's told to find a sofa, it should be able to understand that a sofa should be someplace that's like kind of living roomish uh, with other sofas and maybe a coffee table in that area. Well, you probably don't see a sofa like directly behind the robot next to the stove. Um, 
So having this understanding and ability to um, predict what is around the agent and the interrelationships between different objects is important and can seriously help uh, exploration and navigation. So our basic pipeline is we take an input uh, and we build a map of the environment. And then we hallucinate the unseen portions of the map from the parts of the map that we have seen. And this allows us to reason about these object-object relationships. Um, and use those to uh, more effectively go to places that we haven't been yet. Additionally, uh, we consider not just the predictions, the classes that expect to get these implications, but also its uncertainty, how confident it is that the objects are at those locations. And by reasoning about this uncertainty, in addition to um, its predictions, we can get useful actions out of um, the model, even in places where it may not have great predictions. And we can additionally use this uncertainty to incentivize export, exploratory behavior uh, when training the model. We can make it so the agent goes out and seeks areas that's uncertain about to improve its own prediction. Um, So, uh, more concretely. Sorry, Carl, can I ask yeah. a question? Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, so these maps that we're seeing, are these mm -hmm. top-down views of the apartment or, or what are they exactly? Yeah, these are top-down views of the house, um, egocentric. So the agent is always in the center facing upward. Um, and the blue and green ones are occupancy, with blue being occupied and green being unoccupied and white being unexplored or outside of the house. And then the multicolored ones are semantic maps where white's outside of the house and the other colors are various objects that we can identify with our segmentation models. Okay, so none of these are ground truth coming from the environment, or are they? Yeah, none of these are ground truth. These are all made by um, taking the depth image and the RGB image, performing semantic segmentation on them, and then using geometry and the depth to ground project the depth and to ground project the semantic segmentation. Okay, so you need a ground truth to train this or or not even? Um, yeah, so we train this with ground truth, um, which we can pull from the simulator, but you could also get by um, running like mapping across the entire house until you have like a stable map and comparing between your partial map and that full completed map. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, so we first uh, project the depth down, um, complete the depth to the full depth image, um, ground project the semantic, and then use the semantic and the depth to create a full semantic map of the scene. Um, and then uh, in order to uncertainty, um, we do this uh, multiple times. So we have an ensemble of these models. And uh, a lot of prior work has shown that you can roughly approximate model uncertainty by taking the variance of a set of models. Um, so if we want to uh, actively train the uh, model, we want to navigate to areas with high uncertainty. And uh, prior work has shown that high, high model uncertainty uh, approximately correlates to information gain when you're adding the samples that um, have high uncertainty into your training set. So 
we first perform active training with the system where it goes out and in the simulation, the houses, and drives to locations with high uncertainty and collect data about those. So it'll spend less time spinning around in circles, looking at the same floor over and over and again, and more time looking at like the weird corners of the house where interesting objects are stored. And then when we uh, want to actually accomplish the task, uh, we can additionally leverage the uncertainty um, in two ways. We can either uh, use the um, mean estimate minus uh, some factor of the uncertainty to get a lower bound of how confident we are that the object is actually at that location, that that location has that semantic class. And this allows us to form a safe exploration. Um, where you're reasonably certain that you will find the object. However, there aren't really any big consequences for not really finding the object. So the, the better solution is frequently optimistic exploration, where instead we look at the upper confidence bound of the object um, and follow a policy of optimism and uncertainty to find the object as quickly as possible. And we can see that by using the active training, um, by going out and selecting data points that the model is uncertain about, we can get uh, significantly improved map prediction scores over um, just doing random exploration or other methods of um, selecting which samples the agent should look at. And this um, addition to performing uh, improved general performance, it more specifically provides a lot of improvement on classes that previously the model would perform poorly at. So in our case, our model is shown in orange, and the biggest improvements are on classes like counter and cushion, where the uh, non methods that don't perform curious active exploration don't have a lot of data and don't look at very closely. Um, so here are some uh, qualitative results of our prediction. And uh, this can do some fairly nice things. Um, like in this case, uh, you see the bed, but you don't see anything of the bathroom on the other side of the wall. Like that's not in the ground projection of the environment. But um, it can successfully hallucinate a bathroom on the other side of the wall based on its understanding that like bedrooms and bathrooms, some other information about like, um, doors and things. So by understanding of how houses are built and structured and how objects have co-occurrence, it can make good predictions about things that the agent hasn't yet seen and use these to accomplish its task. So just to double check for a second, Carl, mm -hmm. so you're using like the prediction error that you were talking about is being used as a signal for some agent to explore the environment and collect this data? Um, yeah, so we have two phases. Um, first, when we're doing data collection, the uncertainty of the predictions is used to directly drive exploration. Um, so it forms active exploration, seeking to find data where it's maximally uncertain. Um, and then during uh, test time, when we actually want to go out and find a specific object, um, we also perform the hallucination and then have a policy that runs on top of the predicted map that says, oh, I see a, I don't know, shower, a bathtub in my prediction, predicted map. Um, I'm going to drive there to find the bathroom or find the shower. 
And that's what you were talking about, I think, two slides back. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering for that prediction, like, wouldn't you want to find like the lower bound for the entire plan or like path to get to the object? Yeah. So like we we also have additional terms based on like path lengths and stuff. Um, to make it so you select things that are closer to you um, with higher confidence. Um, but the, the, I think like the key of the policy is that you wanna to go to things that have the maximal upper bound of your uncertainty if you wanna get there quickly and have a good chance of finding things in uncertain times. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so um, it turns out that this works uh, if you want to find objects in the habitat environment. Um, and we can get uh, significantly better results than methods that don't do this hallucination of unseen environments. We can get better results than um, methods that don't do um, this active exploration during training. And in general, it seems to work uh, fairly well. Um, yeah, so, and here's some visualizations of the uncertainty it uses during active exploration. Um, so initially it's fairly uncertain about, uh, I guess, what's down in this corner. Um, you can see the goals and the uncertainty map and goes around and sticks its head in different rooms, looks around another uh, useful exploratory behavior that you want to see. Um, okay. And I have some videos of this result actually happening, but I'm running a little bit low on time, so I think I'll just skip them and uh, move on to uh, language. So instructions are very important, um, both as far as how do we control robots and how do we communicate um, from humans to robots as far as what tasks they want to accomplish and what the environment around them is like. So in this case, we also look at habitat, um, but the visual language navigation task where we want to be able to follow a sequence of instructions and use that to drive a trajectory through the world. Um, so our basic approach is that we uh, take a map, we take the instructions, we parse both of them into a simple format and apply attention to that, um, which we then to get some drawing representation and we use that representation predict waypoints on the map. Um, and it'll go from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this works very nicely if you have the entire map, but you don't start out with the map. Um, you have uh, limited information based on what the agent can actually see. Um, so you can see uh, how different parts of the map correspond to different parts of the destruction. And when you have when you look at how the uh, attention is activated, you can see that um, like say the token couches causes high activation in the area around the couches and the token table causes high activation in the areas around the table. So um, the, the cross model attention between the map representation and the uh, text learns to accurately ground the text in the world. So in order to deal with the fact that we don't uh, see outside of our field of view, we once again turn to map prediction. Um, we follow in a similar pipeline to the previous work. However, um, we have additional information. We have a text. So we also add text of the instruction 
into the prediction of the future map. So some embedding of this text is fed into um, the module that hallucinates the unseen portions of the map, both for occupancy and for semantics. And then from the final completed map, we use the representation of the text and the embedding of the map as an input to our network to fix a sequence of waypoints. So this allows us to uh, ground the text and also leverage it to better understand the world around us. So if we just perform a uh, map prediction in the way that we did in the previous paper, uh, just naively from the observations, we get significantly less uh, good predictions than if we also use information from the text when predicting the map around us. Um, because if the text says uh, uh, proceed past the fireplace and the coffee table, then we should know that there should be a coffee table someplace in the map. So that information in the text uh, allows us to direct our hallucinations to include information that it wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so we select the next waypoint uh, from the sequence of waypoints, drive to with an off the shelf module. Um, and by putting this together, uh, we can get a fairly good success rate um, with our method that's comparable to some of the state of the art methods while using a couple hundred times less data uh, because of the efficiency of the map representations in comparison to just doing like M10 reinforcement learning. And if you give it ground truth maps, it obviously works very nicely. Um, but you don't always have ground truth maps, you are frequently limited by what you can see. Yeah, here's a quick video of it driving around. Um, the red dots show how the fiction of the, so this is the hallucination of the unseen portions of the map with the waypoints along it. Well, this is the ground truth map with the ground truth waypoints. I can play this again. Um, so it walks straight past the table, it turns right, it goes between the counters in the kitchen. Uh, it spends a little bit of time figuring out which pair of counters it should go between until it gets closer um, and sees the refrigerator. And does that to get past the refrigerator? And then it stops in the hallway by the two shelves. And I'll skip the second set of qualitative results. Yeah. So, in conclusion, there's a lot of important things that people do to make it so they can learn effectively and efficiently. Um, we can watch other people performing tasks. We can learn from what they tell us. Um, we can explore curiously, and we have uh, internal representations that are important for efficient learning. And leveraging all these different approaches, I think will be very important for robotic um, as we try to get uh, more complicated and more interesting tasks for our systems. So I'd like to thank that everyone I worked with on all these projects and uh, open the floor for questions in the, I guess, one minute that we have remaining. All right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a bit of time. But any questions people want to start with? I guess it's just a general sort of question, but. Um, and the first example you showed, learning from video. Mm -hmm. This is sort of connected to Google's research research directions where they learn a large language model, they plug it into a robot arm and it just sort of works. I think it's, it, it's a really cool result. Mm -hmm. 
but I feel like it might not scale to other robotic morphologies other than manip manipulation. We can show manipulation results pretty easily as humans because we're good at manipulation. Mm -hmm. I tried to act like, I don't know, uh, Cassie, the robot, or like a robot dog. I think my demonstration might be a bit garbage compared to what the, a good policy would do. Um, yeah. Do you have any reason on how to Yeah, so this? I think there is, I guess, a hierarchy of things in like a robotic system. You have very low level robotic controllers. Uh, you have more mid-level stuff about what you should be doing when you should be doing stuff. And with low level robotic controllers, I think that learning from humans is generally the wrong approach. So if you wanna do something where like, I don't know, you want your quadcopter to fly some dynamic trajectory or you want your Cassie to walk across uneven ground. Like that's something that's very specific to the individual hardware. Um, but if you want your Cassie to be able to say, I don't know, go to the kitchen or something, um, videos of people moving through houses are important because it teaches you things about like, don't interact with these objects, you can interact with this object because it's a door um, and like parts of the world are traversable, parts of the world aren't traversable. And those are more general concepts that are applicable, like not really, don't really depend on the hardware. Um, while things like how do you stand up depends almost entirely on the hardware. So I think the human data is only really good for um, general concepts where the task or the environment are more important than the agent. Thank you. Okay, maybe any last questions? All right, cool. Thank you very much, Carl. I think yeah, we'll thank you. for now and fantastic talk. Looking forward to chatting a bit more. Yeah, definitely. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.